If you want to stream live NFL games this season, direct from NFL Game Pass to any computer, tablet, or device, all for $100 cheaper than NFL Sunday Ticket, stick around to the end of the show, and I'll let this week's sponsor show you how. Hey, Vance, Bob McManaman. Nice to see you, man. Um, hey, Bob. Same here. Uh, I, I wanted to ask you if you feel under pressure, uh, not only with, you know, Isaiah, but all the other defensive pieces Steve has given you yeah. coming off last year as rough as it was statistically. How much pressure is on Vance Joseph going into the season? Uh, well, it's always pressure, you know, and it's, it's pressure for me. You know, I want, I want to be the best, you know, obviously, and I want us to play top 10 defense. And, you know, obviously last year we had some rough moments, but I thought the last month and a half of the season we got better. Those were the first words that Cardinals defensive coordinator Vance Joseph said to the media after he handpicked Isaiah Simmons with the eighth overall pick in the draft. He emphasized over and over throughout that press conference that Arizona absolutely sucked against tight ends in 2019, and he was right. They gave up the most yards and the second most catches in the entire league to tight ends last season, and they also gave up the most touchdowns by a wide margin too. They were unmistakably a disaster at defending the middle of the field. But what Joseph also probably should have mentioned is that the defense as a whole also sucked at covering wide receivers, they sucked at stopping the run, and they sucked at getting off the field on third downs. Basically, everything that you don't want to be bad at, they were bad at. Arizona got absolutely shredded on defense for most of the year, and their lack of defensive production was a big reason why they ended up with the 8th overall pick to select Simmons in the first place. However, despite all of that frustration for 80% of the season, there was still a slight ray of hope late in the year, week 16 to be precise, where Joseph's defense took on a then 11-3 Seahawks squad in Seattle, and shockingly enough, they beat the crap out of them. In that ultimately meaningless game for Arizona, the defense finally at long last came together and played well enough to carry the team to a win, even despite their own quarterback, Kyler Murray, sitting out half the game with an injury. Russell Wilson, a leading MVP candidate at the time, threw for less than 170 yards and took five sacks. The Hawks' backfield collectively only rushed for about 70 yards themselves, and Jacob Hollister, Seattle's leading tight end that game, only caught five passes for 64 yards, which by Arizona standards might as well have been a miracle. Everything finally clicked for what used to be arguably the worst defense in the NFL, and for once they were actually kind of fun to watch. All that being said though, that success did beg the questions. What changed between September and December to generate such drastically different results against the same team? And even after those improvements during the season, why did Joseph still feel that spending a top 10 pick on a linebacker of all positions could turn his defense from just functional into potentially dominant? Truth be told, there's a lot of meat to those answers, and it's going to take a while for me to explain what went right and what went so very, very wrong. But I promise that if you stick with me and watch this whole show, you too will be able to call yourself an expert on... Um, disappointingly mediocre NFL defenses, I guess. So let's just start at the foundation of it all, how Joseph's system works. The Cardinals defense is an interesting and somewhat nuanced attempt to hybridize the philosophies of several legendary defensive minds, Wade Phillips, Mike Zimmer, Bill Belichick, and Nick Saban. Coach Joseph has bounced around the NFL quite a bit over the years, but by far two of his most successful stints as an assistant coach, before he ever even became a coordinator in the first place, were under Wade Phillips in Houston and under Paul Gunther, a notable Zimmer disciple in Cincinnati. And he took a few very distinct philosophies from both of them. From Phillips in particular, Joseph took most of the fronts that made up his aggressive one-gap 3-4 scheme, most notably his signature 5-2 underfront from base personnel, as well as his 4-2-5 nickel overfront in nickel personnel. That 5-2 under is fairly self-explanatory, but we'll go through it anyway, and it's usually what Joseph dials up against heavier offensive personnel packages. It uses five men on the line of scrimmage, three of which are down defensive linemen, two of which are stand-up linebackers on the edges, and then on the second level, there are two more inside linebackers referred to as Mike and Mo. So that's the 5-2 part. This is referred to as an underfront because the weak side defensive end isn't really a defensive end at all, and in fact, he basically plays the same role as a three-technique defensive tackle in a 4-3 defense, 
which is called the under tackle in those kinds of systems. So when you hear 5-2 under front, just think under tackle. The under tackle is the same position that guys like Warren Sapp and Geno Atkins have played over the years in aggressive 4-3 defenses like Tony Dungy's and obviously Mike Zimmer's too. And to further compound that point, when you flip through a great book by my friend Coach Cody Alexander called Hybrids, which details the origin stories of modern hybrid defenses and where they could potentially go in the future, link of course in the description down below, you can actually see a lot of similarities between the Phillips 5-2 underfront and some of the most influential 4-3 underfronts of all time, like Dungy's aforementioned 4-3 defense that he had in Tampa Bay. The only major difference between the Wade Phillips inspired variant of the 3-4 that Joseph runs and the Dungy 4-3 is that Phillips would keep a 5-man surface at the line of scrimmage instead of a 4-man surface by moving the Sam linebacker permanently outside of the tight end on the line of scrimmage, rather than putting him on the second level of the defense. This mainly helped with what's called boxing the front, meaning keeping both of your edge players leveraged outside of the offensive tackles and or the attached tight ends to create hard edges on either side of the box and a very defined area for the linebackers to work within. Phillips and Joseph box their fronts with their outside linebackers basically at all times from both base personnel and from nickel personnel packages because that is the easiest and cleanest way to absolutely dominate zone run games. It is extremely hard to get the edge on an outside zone run if the outside linebackers are just sitting there on the outside and forcing everything back inside before the running back can even get the ball, mind you. And if there's never any way to get an edge, that basically forces the running back into the teeth of the defense on every single zone run. And if the defense knows that a cutback is coming because the edges are boxed in from the start, that means they can just play fast and loose on the inside and shoot as many gaps as possible to make a big play in the backfield. It's a really, really great defensive philosophy that has worked for Phillips and Joseph for a very long time, especially in the NFC West where literally the entire division has been built around zone runs for years now. The other main front that Joseph has carried over from Wade Phillips is the 4-2-5 nickel over meaning four men on the line of scrimmage, two of which are down defensive linemen and two outside linebackers, you get the drill by now, and two more inside linebackers on the second level referred to as the Mike and the Nickelbacker. Most of the time, both outside linebackers, referred to as the Sam and the Will, are obviously boxing the fronts once again, but because one of the interior three defensive linemen gets swapped out for an extra defensive back in nickel personnel groupings, the interior of the front typically gets switched from an under alignment to an over alignment, meaning the three technique is now on the strong side of the offensive formation, not the weak side. And they do that so that those two interior linemen are in a better spot to take on and occupy two blockers each, which frees up the Mike and the Nickelbacker to potentially make more plays unimpeded from the second level. Now, under Vance Joseph, those two staple fronts from Phillips, the 5-2 under and the 4-2 over, often get packaged together in Arizona with two other concepts that are inspired by, among others, Mike Zimmer, Bill Belichick, and Nick Saban. Those concepts are Zimmer's famous double mug blitz looks on third downs and his adaptation of Belichick's and Saban's most famous defensive innovation, the match cover three Rip Liz. Again, referring back to Coach Alexander's wonderful book titled Hybrids, let's start with that match three coverage that was invented by Saban and Belichick when they worked together in Cleveland back in the mid 90s. To paraphrase Alexander's words, the duo came up with these so-called match zones to provide the best advantages of both man coverage and zone coverage to counter the Steelers' spread passing attack of the era, and they stopped that deadly passing game while also giving themselves a numbers advantage in the box against the run, so they were kind of able to have their cake and eat it too. In terms of how Joseph uses the match three today, it hasn't really changed all that much over the last 25 years, or at least not in any major discernible way. Both outside corners are typically gonna be matching the number one receiver to each side, no matter the route, with the one exception being if the receiver breaks short and inside anywhere within the first five yards. If the receiver does break underneath, then the corner will yell under, under, under to the linebackers, and those linebackers will pick up that receiver over the middle while the corner keeps bailing to his deep third zone and looking for any crossing routes coming his way. Meanwhile, the slot corner and the strong safety will both be responsible for the number two receivers on each side with the same general rules for matching them everywhere they go unless they break underneath in the first five yards, in which case they also will yell out to the linebackers to pick those receivers up. 
And if the slot corner and the strong safety do let their receivers go underneath, then they're free to just keep bailing to the hook zones on each side and robbing the routes underneath each outside corner. Also keep in mind that usually these two defenders will be playing those number two receivers from outside leverage so that they can keep their eyes on the quarterback and the receiver at the same time while funneling those receivers inside to the deep safety. But that's really just a minor technical detail that we don't need to explore too much today. Now, last but not least, the linebackers are also critical here because they're responsible for the number three receiver to either side of the field, which is almost always going to be the running back. First, the linebackers will drop to both hook zones on either side of the field to help the slot and the strong safety with the number two receivers. And then once those hook zones get secured, they read through to the running back and the direction of that running back's release, either right or left, will determine which linebacker has to pick him up. In this instance, it's the nickelbacker Hassan Reddick who has responsibility for driving on Christian McCaffrey releasing to his side of the field. So overall, when you really look at the structure of this coverage, it is a cover three zone, but most of the defense are playing those zones with man coverage principles. Plus, every single defender on the outside has helped to the inside against quick breaking routes, and because it's a single high safety look, the defense will almost always have a numbers advantage in the run game as well. The match three is a foundational coverage for most great modern defenses for a reason, and that's because it f***ing works. It's just as effective today as it was almost three decades ago, and it will probably continue to be amazing for the Cardinals in the future if they can execute it correctly. When it comes to how Vance Joseph really likes to run it though, he often does it by taking a page out of Mike Zimmer's playbook and packaging that match three coverage with Zimmer's most famous defensive tool, the double mug alignment. In double mug looks, which conveniently pair very well with most zone coverages, both linebackers are lined up in the A-gaps before the snap, threatening to attack the center simultaneously to overwhelm and collapse the middle of the pocket. It's a highly aggressive alignment that offenses have to respect, or else they might pay the price and accidentally let someone through untouched for a big sack. But most of the time when Joseph shows these double mug looks, just like Paul Gunther before him and Zimmer even before that, they're all doing it for the sole purpose of forcing the offense to change their protections to account for the A-gaps while potentially leaving an elite pass rusher like Chandler Jones with a one-on-one -on -one opportunity. That's what these double mug looks are used for most of the time anyway, as sort of a decoy to give edge rushers some relief from constant chips and double teams. But when you think about it, the offense kind of has no choice but to respect that decoy, even if they know it's a decoy, because the second they don't respect the double mug and the defense finally does bring that blitz, that's when it can truly wreck their day. So overall, to make a long story even longer, that about sums up what Vance Joseph wanted his defense to be all about when he took over as coordinator in 2019. He wanted Wade Phillips inspired 3-4 fronts, Nick Saban inspired pattern match zones, and Mike Zimmer inspired blitz looks all weaved into one system. It's a deadly combination of three of the greatest defensive minds in football history, and on paper at least, it should have been amazing. So why didn't it work? How could all of these great defensive concepts that seemingly fit together perfectly in theory not produce at all? Well, to put it bluntly, the reason for that is that half of Arizona's talent was not playing in the right spots within this system at the beginning of the year. For starters, in the secondary, Byron Murphy was kind of a mess at boundary corner. He constantly missed assignments and zone coverage, he would make mental mistakes every single game, and even when in just straight up man coverage, he wasn't super effective against the big, fast boundary receivers that the league had to offer. I know that he was just a rookie, obviously, but even for a rookie, his first year in the league was pretty bad before they moved him inside to the slot position, where he had a little bit more help. Now, at the same time, on the opposite side of Murphy, you had a revolving door of corners because Patrick Peterson missed the first six games with a suspension, and then he took several more starts once he got back to really settle in and look like his old self again. Tremaine Brock was in and out of the lineup in Peterson's absence. The other Peterson, Kevin Peterson, was just okay in fill-in duty. And ironically, their best corner statistically, Chris Jones, actually got waived after the first few games and then spent most of the season on the practice squad before being promoted again to the active roster for the final few weeks of the season. So taking all of that into account, we really never got to see a cohesive group of corners really gel together or play to their strengths until right about that week 16 stomping in Seattle. It took a long time to land on that group all playing well together, 
but eventually they did. In addition to that, the safety group was also kind of shaky at first because DJ Swearinger just flat out could not cover anyone, including a geriatric Greg Olson who ripped him to shreds. So that experiment only lasted about a month, but then Jalen Thompson got an opportunity to start and eventually started playing pretty well, so that spot was also fixed by the end of the year. Buda Baker is, well, Buda Baker, so he was amazing from start to finish, obviously, but the moral of the story is there was a lot of turnover throughout the year in four of the five main positions in the secondary, and this was in the first year of a new system, mind you, with multiple rookies all trying to figure it out on the fly. All of those circumstances are really hard for any defensive coordinator to overcome, no matter how good the system may be on paper. Now, at the same time, in the front seven, there were also plenty of guys not playing in their best positions and getting punished for it as a result, most notably Hassan Reddick and Chandler Jones. Reddick in particular was forced into playing the Mo and Nickelbacker positions inside for most of the year until he was converted into a Sam outside linebacker for the last month of the season, and for those first 12 games where he played inside, he was really bad. And don't get me wrong, there were some bright spots here and there where his athleticism shined through and he made some big plays, but the instinctual part of playing inside linebacker just did not click with him at all. He was constantly making mental errors and being late to identify and pick up routes and zone coverage, which was a big part of why the Cardinals were so terrible against tight ends, by the way. And in the run game, he had a horrible habit of taking a lot of false steps forward on every single play, so he would get caught in traffic and completely take himself out of where he was supposed to be in the run fit. It was just straight up bad. There's no other way to describe it. There was even a play back in week four, the first time Arizona played Seattle, where Reddick flat out forgot to cover Chris Carson leaking out of the backfield to his side, even though, as we went over before, that was literally his only responsibility in the entire coverage scheme, and Carson was able to get a big gain out of it basically for free. Reddick is not meant to play inside linebacker. He never developed the instincts for it to make it work, either in coverage or against the run and the Cardinals defense as a whole suffered for that miscasting of him for a long, long time. But that also brings up the other main issue with Joseph's front seven. If Reddick was such a bad inside linebacker, why was he forced to play in that spot for most of the year instead of his more natural position of Sam linebacker on the outside? Well, that's because Chandler Jones was playing Sam linebacker for most of the year, which was also a huge problem in its own right. Chandler Jones is one of the three or four best pass rushers in the entire NFL, and at least in a Wade Phillips style system, the Sam linebacker drops into coverage quite a bit when the defense lines up in that 5-2 underfront we discussed earlier. And this is not me saying that's bad because Jones can't make plays in coverage. I mean, obviously he can, he was able to make it work because he's a freak of nature. But to me, this is all one big problem because it's bad to regularly drop your best pass rusher in coverage because defenses would much rather attack Jones with a wide receiver in space than have to deal with blocking him off the edge. Anytime Chandler Jones is not rushing the passer, that's a win for the offense every single time. So just by virtue of that one little nuance of the Vance Joseph system, where the Sam linebacker is sometimes going to be dropping into coverage in base personnel packages, some teams were able to limit Jones's effectiveness as a pass rusher just by forcing the Cardinals into those base personnel packages where he was more likely to drop. Now, you may be wondering at this point, okay, if this problem was so simple that some random asshole on YouTube could figure it out in a few days, why wouldn't Vance Joseph recognize that all of this was happening and just move Chandler Jones to Will Linebacker earlier in the season and move Reddick to Sam? Well, that brings us to the root problem of all the other problems that Joseph had to deal with, Terrell Suggs. Joseph could not make the position switches he wanted to do and needed to do at that time because if Jones played Will instead of Sam, then Suggs would have had to play Sam instead of Will. And boy, if you think Chandler Jones looks goofy dropping into his own and chasing after receivers in space, wait until you see 37-year-old Terrell Suggs do it because it ain't pretty. Joseph knew that he could not risk exposing Suggs in coverage at all or his entire system would fall apart even more than it already did. So he just gritted his teeth and kept him at Will Linebacker against his better judgment while Jones played Sam and Reddick played Mo. And that was the arrangement that he stuck with for the majority of the year until this happened. 
announcing just a few minutes ago, Matt, that the team has released veteran pass rusher Terrell Suggs. Kingsbury called this a mutual decision, said that discussions have been ongoing even prior to this week as Suggs' playing time has shrunk over the course of the season. Terrell Suggs being released with just three games left in the season came as a shock to a lot of people, but it changed everything in Arizona. With Sizzle permanently out of the lineup, Coach Joseph was finally able to play his guys in their best and most impactful positions. Jones moved to Will Linebacker immediately where he got five sacks and a whopping 15 pressures over the next three games. Reddick was finally able to play Sam Linebacker, which is a position that is a lot less mentally demanding and he could just let his athleticism take over in a more streamlined role, so he drastically improved as well. And with the aforementioned changes to the secondary taking place over that same time period, and all of them gelling together too, all of a sudden this Cardinals defense in December looked a hell of a lot different than the dumpster fire they used to be in September. The system didn't really change, and Joseph's philosophy didn't go through any major overhauls, he just finally put the right players in the right places to succeed, and the results spoke for themselves. By no means did they suddenly become an elite unit overnight, but they were at least average, which was a far cry from where they were at the start of the season. It was legitimately an amazing improvement, all brought on by one big personnel move. But even with all of the positional musical chairs that the Cardinals went through over the past month of the season, as I said, they still did have a ton of room for further improvement. Which brings us once again back to this. Again, he's he's a six four guy. He ran four three. He's got great lateral quickness. He's so long. He can he can make up the lack of some quickness with his length. Uh, I wouldn't I wouldn't bet against him, but I think what he did at Clemson, some of it would translate. And some of it won't. By the time Steve Keim, Cliff Kingsbury, and Vance Joseph got into their virtual war room for the 2020 NFL Draft, they knew they still had one more position that they desperately needed to fill, inside linebacker. They struggled there all season long, whether it was Hassan Reddick, Joe Walker, or anyone else they put there. And above all, in this defense, if you don't have good linebackers on the inside that can cover in nickel situations, the system will never ever live up to its highest potential. So, to fix that last lingering problem, the Arizona coaching staff turned to the one prospect that is seemingly genetically engineered to play that nickel linebacker role, Isaiah Simmons. Simmons is, well, you know who he is by now, he's a freak. If a running back gets to the edge on a well-blocked toss play, he can track them down with ease. If the offense tries to get him matched up on a tight end, he's big and long enough to survive in coverage against them without getting boxed out. Plus, unlike Joe Walker and Hassan Reddick, Simmons has phenomenal range and feel for zone coverage and can do everything from buzzing out to a curl flat zone to rob the boundary to dropping deep in some sort of inverted zone look that can trick quarterbacks into throwing really bad interceptions. The fact that he's used to playing inside linebacker means that his instincts are already far more developed than Reddick's ever were, and the fact that he's a genetic anomaly means that he can actually get to landmarks and make plays that Walker could never dream of. Simmons is, for all intents and purposes, the best of both worlds, mentally and physically. But perhaps the one thing that he brings to the table the most, that the Cardinals never really had before in any of their inside linebackers, is how he can improve the Cardinals pass rush when they only rush four or fewer defenders. Per Sports Info Solutions, our favorite stats website on this channel, the Cardinals rushed four guys on 68% of opposing passing plays, which was the 11th highest rate in the league and their pressure rate on those four-man rushes was ranked 10th at 34%. So, knowing those two numbers, you would theoretically think that Arizona would be fairly highly ranked in total sacks as well, but they were actually only at 17th in the NFL in sack total at just 40, which is roughly two and a half a game. Because their only really great pass rusher in that four-man rush was Chandler Jones, their pressure rates, and by extension their sack rates, were mostly tied to Jones' performance and nobody else. He did have more than double the pressures of the next closest Cardinal on the team after all, and he was literally tripling Reddick's pressure rate in the final three games of the year after Reddick was finally moved outside. To put it bluntly, Arizona had a very one-dimensional pass rush in 2019, centered almost entirely around Jones, and for 2020 they desperately needed someone else in that front seven that could contribute not just to disrupting, but to actually sacking the quarterback. That is where Isaiah Simmons comes in. Clemson did blitz Simmons quite a bit during his college career, and they would actually rush him off the edge as well, where he had some success, 
but by far his best value from a pass rush perspective was as a spy and a cleanup player when quarterbacks were forced out of the pocket by the actual pass rushers in front of him. There were several instances where Clemson defensive coordinator Brent Venables would only send three on the rush and then use Simmons as a QB spy for a soft fourth rusher, and when quarterbacks would get antsy and try to move out of the pocket away from that three-man rush, he would then use that crazy closing speed to slam the door shut and finish the sack. That right there is the one thing that Vance Joseph really needed to finally make his defense complete. A finisher. I think the best example of that talent for finishing plays came in the Louisville game last year where Venables dialed up a coverage that, in their playbook, is called Dime Spy Tampa. In particular, it was their trips open adjustment within that whole umbrella of coverage adjustments. And what Dime Spy Tampa means in that Venable system is that the defense is in a dime front, which is a three-man surface consisting of a defensive end, a nose tackle, and another defensive end, with three linebackers behind them, the Mike or middle linebacker, the Will or the weak side linebacker, and the dime linebacker, which on this play is Simmons. The Tampa part of that defensive call is fairly self-explanatory. It means they're in an aggressive version of what's called a Tampa 2 read, which I'm sure most of you know what that is by now if you've ever played Madden, and the spy portion of the call means that the dime linebacker, who again is Simmons, is playing the role of a QB spy. So all in all, just to recap, it's a three-man rush from a dime front with Tampa 2 read coverage on the back end, and the fourth member of the pass rush is just spying the quarterback for when he gets flushed from the pocket. Pretty simple stuff, right? Well, it gets even simpler. Pay close attention to the D-line here. The front three know that they are likely not going to be the ones to get the sack because it's three rushers against five or even six pass protectors, and it's almost impossible to win on a pass rush with three guys against those kinds of numbers in protection. But if instead of winning for a sack themselves, they can focus more on making the quarterback uncomfortable in the pocket, Simmons can do all of the winning for them. That's why left defensive end Logan Rudolph's rush here was so smart, because all he was doing was just setting Simmons up to finish the job he started. Rudolph knew that he was not going to beat a double team here, he's not built for that. So instead, he just ran a really wide arc around the quarterback that left a huge void right up the middle, almost inviting the passer to step up into that space. At the same time, Simmons himself was also hanging out, lurking on the backside to leave that gap open as well, because they both wanted to funnel the quarterback into that space where he felt a false sense of security. They wanted him to run away from his own protection into danger, and as soon as the QB did instinctively move into that soft area of the pocket, as most quarterbacks will tend to do without even thinking about it, that's when Simmons finally pounced and took him down with his insane closing speed. Truth be told, there was really no reason for the quarterback to step up into Simmons' pressure in the first place. He only had one receiver on that side of the field, and he was doubled by the Will linebacker buzzing out underneath him, so there was really nobody to throw to over there, and the pocket was holding up well against a three-man rush. But mind games are called mind games for a reason, because they screw with quarterbacks and force them into mistakes. Having a piece like Simmons that can capitalize on those forced mistakes is a valuable thing to have for any defense, but especially for one that struggles to finish sacks like Arizona. And again, running these spy coverages out of exotic looks is something that Vance Joseph already sort of kind of does. The coverages aren't exactly the same, nor are the personnel groupings or the fronts, but the general concept is similar enough to those Brent Venables-esque packages that they can be easily integrated into Joseph's existing system. I mean, hell, those match three coverages we talked about earlier in this show were a huge portion of Clemson's playbook already anyway, so Isaiah Simmons already knows how to run them from like four different positions. He's not going to have a problem picking up this system, even as a rookie. And if anything, to be honest, Joseph might add more concepts this season just for Simmons so that they can copy all the crazy stuff he was doing in college. Overall, going back to Joseph's comments about Simmons being a chase player who can act as an eraser for the defense, he's actually going to be so much more than that. Simmons isn't just a fast guy who can cover tight ends, he was quite literally the missing piece for making this whole defense work. They already have a stud Will Linebacker in Chandler Jones who's finally playing Will Linebacker again. They have not one, but two solid Sam linebackers now in Devon Kennard and Hassan Reddick, who can both rotate in and out depending on the down and distance. They still have a deep and talented rotation of interior defensive linemen too, with Corey Peters, Jordan Phillips, Zach Allen, Lecky Fotu, and Rashard Lawrence. 
At Mike linebacker, they have the always stout Jordan Hicks, and in the secondary, they finally have a group that can be semi-reliable in Patrick Peterson, Byron Murphy, maybe Robert Alford if he's healthy, Jalen Thompson, and of course the sensational Buda Baker. Literally the only thing that was left missing for this defense was a fast, aggressive, rangy, and versatile nickel linebacker that could bring it all together, and now the Cardinals have that in Isaiah Simmons. When I first started doing my research for this episode, scouring statistics sites and watching as much film as I could, I honestly had no hope for this team going into 2020. But the more I watched and the more I understood about what went wrong and what they were trying to get right, that hopelessness turned to excitement and then the excitement turned into expectations. Arizona, believe it or not, has all of the pieces now to create a truly nasty defense. And I think that sooner rather than later, we're going to see that nastiness come to life. It feels like there's something brewing in the desert, something new and dangerous. All of you should pay attention to what's happening down there because whether you see these guys coming or not, trust me, they are coming. And when they do finally put it all together as a team, which I think they will, watch out. Because if I'm right, the Red Sea is finally about to rise again. And that is a very scary thought. My suggestion to the rest of the NFC, now is a good time to go grab a paddle. You're probably going to need it. Thank you for watching this week's episode, and thank you to this week's sponsor, NordVPN. If you're like me and you cut the cord a long time ago, the most difficult part about that decision has always been finding a way to stream live NFL games. But with NordVPN, it's now easier than ever to do so legally. All you have to do is download NordVPN, select a server somewhere in Europe, like Germany, and once you connect to a German server, that will give you access to the European version of NFL's Game Pass subscription service, which is the service that I use to make episodes every single week. In the American version of Game Pass, you don't get access to live streaming of NFL games, but in the European one, you do get access to every single regular and postseason game, and the Super Bowl, and it's 100 bucks cheaper than NFL Sunday ticket would be on top of an existing DirecTV subscription. Plus, it also comes with all of the normal NFL Game Pass features as well, like NFL Network Live 24-7, the All-22 Coaches Tape, full game replays and highlights for games going back the last decade, and tons of NFL films and NFL Network programming like America's Game and A Football Life. NFL Game Pass streaming on NordVPN is by far the best way to stream live NFL content, Plus, the league still gets paid too through that Game Pass subscription, so it's not even pirating. It's all legal, everybody wins, but especially you, the football fan. If you're interested in upgrading your game watching setup this season and you want to try this out, you can get 68% off of a two year plan for NordVPN that makes it less than $4 a month. Plus, you get an additional month free at nordvpn.com slash Brett Coleman or by using my promo code Brett Coleman at checkout. Again, thank you to NordVPN for sponsoring this week's show and for giving us all a better option to stream live games this season. As for me and Channel News, I've got yet another episode coming out, uh, I think sometime later this week, probably Friday. So knowing me, it'll be Saturday or Sunday. I don't know. It's coming out soon. I don't even know what it's on yet. I think maybe Justin Fields, but I'm not going to lie, people. I'm fucking winging it at this point. Uh, I, I got my fantasy rankings up on the Patreon. Again, anybody who contributes at least a dollar to the Patreon gets those. I put up the PPR rankings. I'm still finalizing the standard rankings, so those will be up sometime probably today based on when I'm recording this. Uh, and then I'll have the combined rankings as well. And then I'll be updating those every single week uh, as we kind of go through fantasy draft season all the way up to week one. So again, all patrons get access to the Excel documents. And I'm also making PDFs for you guys to work off of for your fantasy drafts. Doesn't matter how much you give can be a dollar or anything really. Uh, but yeah, I'm uh, I'm in full on wing it mode for this August. It's always a crazy month for me uh, leading up to week one. So New film rooms coming, fantasy rankings out, podcasts out. Uh, and yeah, I'm going to go get back to work on whatever this next episode is going to be. I'm, I'm figuring it out. If you have suggestions, leave them below. So until then, later. <laughs>